Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here today. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, we'd like to welcome you and hope that you are blessed by your worship with us this morning and that you might come back again. We'd also like to ask you if you'd fill out the tear-off tab that's on the front of the bulletin with your information and place in the offering plate as it's passed. Also, uh, if any of you have prayer requests, you can note that on that flap also and place it in the offering plate as it's passed. I'd um, like to remind you to sign the red books that are located at the end of the pew so we have a record of your attendance. Also, I'd like to ask you if you would continue to remember our missionaries in prayer, and specifically this month, Greg Sabbath, who has, is involved in a mission to the Jewish people in the United States. We have no anniversaries this week, but we do have a couple birthdays. Andy Call and Sharon Lawrenson, happy birthday to you. Hope you have a great day. As far as announcements go, today at 11.30 there will be, in place of the normal covered dish dinner, there will be a, a dinner uh, provided by those going to Nicaragua on their mission trip. Everybody's invited to stay and listen to their presentation. A free will offering will be taken to defray their expenses. If you're inclined to donate to that, you're welcome to. Also, if you uh, would like to donate to that, but you're unable to attend the, the dinner, um, you can write a check, place it in the offering plate, and just designate it for the Nicaragua trip. This evening at 5 o'clock is evening service. 6 o'clock is youth. Monday, the trustees will meet at 6.30. Wednesday, 8 o'clock a.m. is a adult breakfast. 9.30 is la ladies' prayer here at the church. 3.45, Circle J. 6 o'clock is choir, and 7.20 is the ladies' video Bible study. So it's a full day. So if you'd like to be involved in those, you've got lots of opportunities. Next Saturday at 8 o'clock a.m. is the men's breakfast. Please RSVP in the, in the Red Book so they have an idea of how many will be attending. Tuesday, November the 12th at noon, uh, FBWM will meet, and Abby Sprague, who is the new director of the Lighthouse will give a presentation on their needs, their changes in the operations, and uh, anything that uh, she might want to share about that. Lunch will be served, and also if you have jewelry for Nicaragua, that's the time to bring it. There's a sign-up sheet for poinsettias out in front of the office. If you'd like to purchase a poinsettia, uh, sign your name and the number that you'd like. The color and the cost is yet to be determined, but that is normally very, very attractive. Operation Christian Child, love in a shoebox supplies are available in the south entryway. The deadline for returning those to the church is November the 24th at 1 o'clock p.m. So you might make preparation for that. I believe that's all the announcements that we have. So now if you'd stand, we'll turn our attention to a time of worship in the same blessed be the Lord God Almighty.
God and Father in heaven, we come to worship you this morning and, and we're thankful that we can worship in your house and be together as a family as we do so. We pray that you'll be with us to do this service, that you might be in our midst, that you might guide our hearts, guide our minds. Be with our pastors. He delivers your message that his words might be your words and that you might touch us and, and that we might take those words to heart, that we might utilize them. We pray for those who are traveling, those who are ill, that you might be with them. And we thank you for, for all the many veterans that we have, that we come in contact with, that protect our nation, who give us the protect our right to worship you. We thank you for them. We ask the special blessing upon them. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture this morning is out of the book of Ephesians, verses 1, 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chooses in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he has made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the death dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. May be seated. Now if you take your hymnals or watch on the screen, we'll sing verses 1 and 3 of the next two songs, um, page 12 and page 300.
presentation to honor our veterans and active service people. There's a video that goes along with this. Uh, there's a, a little video at the beginning of this that um, kind of drives home the point of what these service people do when they deploy, when they s decide to serve our country, also what their families go through at that time. And then following that, there's, I'd like it to just be kind of a solemn thank you for each and every one of the servicemen that we had pictures with. Um, so uh, if you keep that in mind and as you see their picture, just thank God for them. Shall we pray? Our God and Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we have this opportunity that we can share some of the bounty that you've given to us. We pray that you might take it, that you might bless it, and use it for your will here on earth, and that you might bless each gift and each giver. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, it is with humble and thankful hearts that we bow before you this morning, and we do give you thanks and praise for all those that were pictured in so many more, Lord, that have given of themselves and many um, have made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we enjoy uh, today. We lift them to you, all those that are serving our nation and that have served our nation, and pray that your hand would be upon them, pray that you would bless them in a special way this day, every day. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we as a nation, that we would truly uh, celebrate Veterans Day every day of the year. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you give us, and we thank you that we live in a nation that does care about those that serve and is aware of the results and um, the freedoms that are won because of these individuals. We pray again a special blessing upon them this day. We pray also for the special needs within the congregation that have also been uh, noted. We pray for Miss Bonnie. Um, and ask for your healing hand to be upon her after uh, her fall. We ask, Lord, that you give her comfort and encouragement, Lord. We continue to pray for uh, the Sutton family, Lord. Uh, Father, this morning we lift you the family of John Sutton, uh, Randy's father, Lord, uh, who passed away this past uh, week. We ask, Lord, that you, your hand of comfort and peace would be upon them all. And, Lord, we just give you thanks and praise that John did have a tell, or did uh, make a profession of faith uh, as he visited with Randy uh, prior to his passing. And so this morning we can take comfort and have hope in the, the reunion that one day will occur uh, for all those that are believers in Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that there are others that are dealing with sickness or injury this day and we lift them to you. There are many that have unspoken requests and Father God, again, we lift those to you and pray that you would work in each of those situations. Father God, we just give you thanks that you are a God that first is alive. You are a God that loves us and you are a God that is active in our lives. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to bless and encourage each of us as we are faithful and obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
allowed to join you. The children may be dismissed for Children's Church. And we thank Mr. Brinkman for heading that up for us this morning. There's always something that you can find to be excited about. Uh, last week we had the opportunity to talk about God's love. And isn't it always interesting that um, uh, when you talk about something, I don't know if it's just me that notices this, but a lot of times what we talk about in church, uh, I have the opportunity to practice it throughout the week. And so it's just a reminder, you know, sometimes it was, a, you know, one of the things we talked about was how whatever we are facing, God's love is there. And there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And last Sunday night, we had the opportunity to go through uh, Romans chapter 8. We started at verse 35 and went to 39. Uh, and there are, in that passage description, uh, scripture, four short verses, 17 different things that are listed, I shouldn't tell you this, because those of you that go, well, that's why I don't come to Sunday Night Bible Study, because he has 17 points. Uh, we kind of did like a little matching game kind of thing. But it just reminded me uh, that, you know, we think about all these things, oh, well, if this happens or that happens or this happens or that happens, and the truth, of course, is that what, what does Scripture tell us? Nothing can separate us from the love. Of God. So if you have a, a bad day, if you had a, a rough week, you know, we had the opportunity to go on vacation a couple weeks ago, and since then we came home, and one of our cars got a flat tire, another car had um, uh, a battery died, and then another thing, our refrigerator died, and you just sit here going, aren't you glad that the Bible says nothing except a dead refrigerator can separate you from the love of God? <laughs> But it's those silly things sometimes, because you know you wouldn't think that a dead battery in a car would be that big of a deal until you've got two kids to take to school on that morning, and you're, it's cold. And, and then the worst thing was, is I got a battery to replace the dead battery, and it wasn't even the battery that was the problem. So I was just like, all right, Lord. And the whole time I was just like, well, you know what? This is just in God's hand, and God's going to work this, and there's a reason. And that was the thing I was thinking, there's a reason for these things. And sometimes it is to just stop us and remind us that God is in control and that God's love uh, is real and that it is there. And so even this morning, like when we have technical problems, I leaned over to Susan and I said, God has a reason. God has a plan. I don't know why God did that because I purposely planned a shorter sermon because I thought we were going to have a, a longer video presentation and now we might get out of church early. And I know you say, say it isn't so, Pastor Matthew. <laughs> so for those of you who are wondering why my talk while the choir is being seated has gone a little bit longer, that's why. Well, our message this morning, we're continuing to look at the promises of God. And aren't we glad that we have a God, first of all, Aren't we glad that we have a God that is alive? Aren't we glad that we have a God that cares? Aren't we glad that we have a God that wants to be involved and is involved in our lives? And aren't we glad that we have a God that we can trust? Amen. That when he makes a promise, you know, and every promise is yes and amen, right? Some people, if they make a promise, you go, yeah, that'll never happen. <laughs> but when God makes a promise, we can depend on it. Last week we did talk about uh, God's love, and again, we were reminded that nothing, not a zilp, zip, zilp, zero, separates us from the love of God, and we're reminded in Romans 5, 8, the powerful reminder that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we can kind of understand, you know, and Scripture even says, I could get it, you know, I'm a pretty good guy, right, Kimberly? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Diana, I'm a pretty good guy. Yes, that's why you're my favorite male. You and Cindy are my favorite male women. Oh, Heather's here. Or not Heather. Melissa's here. Oh, I got myself. I love all the males. I just love some of them more than others. Anyways, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. And some people would say, you know, yeah, I'd sacrifice this, that, other. But how many of you, and family, you're off the hook. You don't have to answer honestly. How many of you would give your life for me? Danny? Oh, yay! <laughs> you know? 
and you know, as this, you know, we would do it for our family. I would lay my life down for my wife, my kids, you know, in a heartbeat, you know. I hope the time doesn't come that I have to do that. But, but we think about this. This is an enemy. Mike, you think about the person that you don't like. I know you like everybody, but just imagine that there's somebody out there that you don't like. Somebody that, you know, not even that you don't like, but is an enemy of yours. And imagine you're going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to lay my life down for them. You go, no, it's not going to happen. But that's what God did. That's what Christ did. While we were his enemy, he laid his life down for us. Today, we continue in this consideration of the promises of God, and we look at another one that is so important to us. It's the promise of redemption. And hopefully you noticed in the songs that we sang, I kept nudging Susan. Susan loves to sit next to me in choir. I love to have Susan sit next to me because she always points out where I'm supposed to sing, where I'm not supposed to sing. She looks at me, kind of nudges me a little bit. I did so well in the rehearsal this morning. I sang the song just right, and then when we actually did it, I missed a couple things, but that's okay. Not even that will separate me from the love of God. So, But our passage this morning comes from another epistle that the Lord inspired Paul to write to the church. This time it's from the, it's from the letter to the church at Ephesus. And as you'll remember, that's a letter that's written to encourage us as believers as we seek to live productive lives spiritually. You'll remember it was written while Paul was in prison, and that's not generally an upbeat kind of place, but yet the tone of it is one of joy. And again, we as believers should be a people of rejoicing, right? You know. Now, when you drop a hammer and it lands on your toe, it's okay to have a frown for a little bit. It's okay to be irritated, you know, with that. But we generally should be positive people. Because we know the end of the story. We know where we're going. And we see that. We see this joy. And, and in fact, the, the first sentence of this letter, in it, where, or the, in the first sentences of this letter, we're reminded, according to verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, that God had a plan for us before the very foundations of the world. Now, if we stop and just pause and, and ponder that for a second, just imagine that. First, it's amazing that the creator of the universe, again, loves us, that he thinks about us, but we realize that before we were created, before this planet was created, before anything was created, God had us all in mind. He had me in mind. He had you in mind. Now, I always appreciate when people take a moment and contemplate or consider me. You know, if somebody's having you over and they think about things, you know, I have a reputation that I don't like mayonnaise and I don't like sour cream and I don't like cottage cheese and um, that kind of stuff. And the other day or a couple weeks ago, we had somebody visit our house and they called Danielle and said, oh, Danielle, I made a mistake. I made cheesecake. And pastor doesn't like cream cheese. And she said, well, that's okay. And I will say that uh, while I don't care for cream cheese, I have learned to eat cheesecake. So anytime you want to bring a cheesecake by, feel free. And speaking of people that drop food off, if you were the person that left me a bag of blueberry zucchini bread on my desk, thank you. I don't know. There was no name in it. Uh, it, it was delicious. Um, and I, again, I always encourage, you know, if, if the Lord lays it, uh, lays it on your heart, blueberry zucchini bread or whatever it might be, you feel free because I don't want to rob you of a blessing. <laughs> Anyways, I, we like it when people take an opportunity to think about us. But here we have somebody working on our behalf. Before the very ground that we walk on was formed, before the air that we breathe existed, before it all. And this should give us cause to celebrate every day. Even on those days when our batteries are dead and our tires are flat. Even when people give you cheesecake. We should remember, we should celebrate. But when we get to verse 7 of Ephesians 1, this is where we find our message for today. It says, in him we have redemption through his, that his is Jesus through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And we're going to focus on that word, redemption. You know, in 2019, to redeem uh, generally means that we have taken or gained possession of something, usually uh, in exchange for money. Now, we don't very often think about the idea of redeeming things. In fact, um, most of the time when I think of redeeming something, it's associated with some kind of a financial transaction or some kind of an offer. You know, nowadays there's uh, 
or, D, or there's a coupon, or there's a promotion code. I like to, if I'm shopping for something, to shop for the best prices that I can get. And sometimes there's a, a promotion code, and they say, redeem this offer, or something like that. And in the book of Ephesians, uh, we come across this word, and it's a word that we use in church life. It's used throughout the New Testament. Uh, we read about it in the pages of Scripture. It's also in the songs. You didn't know we had so many songs that talked about redemption and redeeming and our Redeemer. We sang a couple of them this morning. And so it reminds us that it's important. And it's good. Because it's a promise of God. But what does redemption mean for us? To understand it and to apply it, we, we want to look first at the, one of the roots of this word redemption. And don't get too scared. And that's really to look at the idea of to redeem. To redeem. And biblically, there's really three ideas that are associated with this idea of redeeming something. And the first one is to release or to set free by paying the full ransom. All right? Freedom. To be set free. Freedom, especially this weekend, is something that we really cherish that we celebrate, that we recognize, that we value. We as Americans, we recognize that the great cost that is associated with freedom. Freedom exacts a huge cost for us. Sometimes we have to be willing to fight for our freedoms and the freedoms of others. And we remember and we honor those that served and that do serve our nation so honorably and so selflessly. It isn't easy, you know. It isn't easy even in the best of circumstances. And unfortunately, at times, uh, serving can sometimes be thankless as well. We don't want that to be the case. But it reminds us that we should never forget the price that was paid for our political freedoms, you know, like we talked about last week or a couple weeks ago when we had the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. We're reminded that not every person that believes in Jesus Christ can publicly announce that without fear. But we can but even more than our political freedom, we celebrate to our spiritual freedom. Because when we have been set free, as John 8, 36 reminds us, therefore if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So though, like Paul, we might be put in prison one day for our belief, we can still be free. Though we might be persecuted and prosecuted, though we might be oppressed, we will be free spiritually. And so today, as Americans, we are free. We are free both from the bonds and binds of tyranny, and we rejoice. But again, today, as Christians, we are free from the tyranny of sin. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means we can decide. We can decide for ourselves. We have a choice. You know, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we don't have to sin. What do you mean? Well, apart from Christ, when we are, are unsaved, when we're lost, we're bound to sin. We're slaves to sin. We crave sin. But when we accept Jesus, he cuts that. We are no longer under its power and its control. We are redeemed. We are set free. And that's the first part of this idea of being redeemed. We are released from the power of sin. Second... Biblically, to redeem means to restore something back to, it, back, uh, back to the possession of its rightful owner. I have an error in my notes here. I've got too many words. To restore something back into the possession of its rightful owner. Now, God's grace, we often note, is what? Amazing, right? It's amazing. And sometimes the word is used so much that we really stop appreciating. I remember when I was young, growing up, my mother, there was a word that she just loved to say, and it was the word awesome. Now, yes, I did grow up in the 80s, and everything was awesome, and, you know. Uh, but, you know, my mother would say everything was awesome. And guess what? When everything is awesome, sooner or later, nothing really becomes awesome, right? And we talk about God's grace, and we say it's amazing, and it's amazing, and there's a danger that we might, you know, kind of go, yeah, well, God's grace, it's amazing. Yay. But amazing means to cause wonder. It, it means to be surprised. It means to be astonished by something. And there are many times in our lives when God's grace and God is amazing. He surprises us. 
He astounds us. We are surprised by him. You know? And so when we say things like God's grace is amazing, we need to make sure that we truly appreciate it and, and recognize it and, and don't let the use or the overuse of a word kind of just, you know, throw a wet blanket on something because our God is amazing and our God's grace is amazing. Amen. And this is truly the case when we think about this idea of being redeemed because he goes beyond just simply restoring he goes beyond simply restoring. He brings us back to himself. He rest or he goes beyond... Uh, yes, he brings us... He restores us. He brings us back to himself. It reminds us of the, the prodigal or lost son in Luke chapter 15. You remember him? Uh, he wanted his inheritance, and so his father gave him his inheritance, which that's not a choice I would have necessarily made as a, as a father. But the son gets the money, gets the stuff, he, he runs off, and what does he do? He wastes it. As a prodigal, that needs to be, he is wasteful. And of course, it doesn't take him very long. Isn't that amazing how that works? It doesn't take it very long for him to find himself in the position of needing and wanting. Again, he's gone through all of his money, and he comes to his senses. It's one of my favorite parts of that passage of Scripture. It kind of like he, he comes to himself. He, he kind of smacks himself. He has that aha moment. Mo mo moment. Yeah. He's like, oh! He comes back to his senses. He realizes what he's done and what he must do and he goes back to his father and he doesn't even he doesn't even try to say dad can I come back home he says dad hire me just let me work for you because he knew that his dad took care of his employees he was like just let me work for you but the father doesn't do that no instead he restores his son to his place in the family now, the other brother, he's not too happy with that, and that's another sermon for another day. But on a small scale, that's a wonderful picture of what God has done. Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20 says, For it pleased the Father that in him all, that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in, the earth, in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now, if you're clever, you might say, well, we're talking about uh, redemption, that we're talking about restoration, and you just use another word, the reconcile. Why use the word reconcile? Well, to reconcile means to restore relationship. That's why I mention it. To make it compatible. And again, as we look at it, it is a tremendous thing that God would free us from the power of sin. We now have a choice. We do not have to sin, but he also restores us. He reconciles us. He restores our relationship. And yet, this amazingly gracious God doesn't stop there. It reminds me of all those infomercials, right? Where they, they tell you it can do this, and it can do this, and here's this, but we're not done yet. You know? And that's how it is with God when we think of the redemption. It's not just that. It's not just um, releasing us, and it's not just restoring us, but to redeem also means to rest. To rescue from the power and the possession of foreign, a foreign possessor. So far, God has released us and restored us, and we say, Amen. We'll take it, right? And they are great, and I, again, I don't want to diminish it. I'm not trying to diminish those truths in any way. But we would think that would be enough. But again, because of God's great love, he didn't stop there. There's another thing that we want to mention. Because being released and being restored leaves us with a problem. Because uh, Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? Aww. All but Irene Jensen. <laughs> Even Irene Jensen. Did you want to give us an example, Mike? <laughs> or... Greg, why do I keep calling you Mike? I'm sorry. I know, I know your name. I'm sorry. You'll all say he'll never call on us again because of that. You wish. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know your name is Greg. Is there a Mike Jensen? Yeah. Is he a good guy? Well, sure. Well, that, that works. Greg has now joined the Pastor Protection Plan program. Oh, I apologize. And I... It's okay. I will not talk about you at least the next two minutes. Anyways. anyways. Somebody should have said something. This is what, anyway, so... Uh, all right. 
All right, so Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're reminded too in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. In releasing us, God has given us an option, given us control, right? We're no longer under the power of sin. We make the choices, and again, hopefully we make the wise choices. In restoring us, God has made it possible for us to have fellowship and relationship, but that leaves us again with the punishment or consequence of sin, and that's where rescue comes in. Rescue means to save someone from danger. Have you ever been in danger? God, in His act of redeeming us, rescues us from the punishment of sin. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Comma. Aren't you glad it's not a period? It's one of those things. It's one of those, you know, I remember hearing a sermon about the, and Lucas isn't here so I can say this. I remember hearing a sermon once about the, and I, as a pastor, I was kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about, but the title was uh, The Best Butts in the Bible. And yeah, so I was like, oh. But anyways, um, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. To redeem, or to be redeemed by God means that the consequence that we deserve, that we have earned through our sin, was removed from us. Now listen clearly, clearly, because I didn't say that the punishment disappeared. I didn't say the punishment was forgotten. Because it wasn't. 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 24 says this, For to this you were called, because Christ also <laughs> suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, did not, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. In rescuing us, God the Father, through Christ God the Son, did what we could not do on our own. He rescued us. We try and try, and that history is full of man's attempts through laws, through politics, through systems, through good works, through money. It doesn't work. As the song says, what can wash away our sin? $35 in the offering plate. Is that how the refrain goes? No. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As we draw to our conclusion, I want to add one more thought to highlight the difference between simply to redeem and the idea of redemption. Redeem is to release, to restore, to rescue. Right, Greg? Yes. yes. I'll never, ever say his name wrong again. Redemption is to repurchase that which has been lost. Again, we celebrate what God has done through His own plan, through His own action, motivated by His own love, that He has released and restored and rescued a fallen, sinful people, and He has brought them back and repurchased them unto Himself. He loves us so much. He's not willing to lose a single one of us. Not one human being. You know, we look at humanity and we go, boy, those are some rotten people. We think of the people like Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden. We think of them and we think, boy, they deserve whatever they get. You know what? You know who else should be listed with Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden? Matthew Coleman. I know some of you were sweating because you thought I was going to say your name, but I have enough sense not to do that. But God isn't willing that any should perish. God doesn't want to lose one single person. But he allows us to make that choice. But there's one last special emphasis in this word redemption that I want us to note today. Redemption is meant to focus on the distance that results from the redeeming. 
when we are redeemed, there is a distance that is created. And we are to realize and to remember the distance that's created between those that have been released and restored and rescued and repurchased, those people, and what they were previously enslaved to. Are you with me? When we speak of being redeemed, we celebrate that we are released, we are restored, we are rescued, we are repurchased. And when we speak of redemption, we celebrate the fact that those that are released, rescued, restored, and repurchased, we celebrate the distance we're released from the power of sin and the distance that is created as a result of what God has done, that we are no longer connected to sin. And isn't that fascinating? Last week we talked about how we are not separated from the love of God. And this week we're talked about how we are distant from sin. Both of these are promises of God and they're accomplished as a result of the work of Jesus Christ. I conclude with verses from 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 17. It says, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but, by, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's not gold, it's not silver, it's not works. It's the blood of Jesus that redeems us, that releases us, that restores us, that rescues us, that repurchases us, so that we can be distant from sin and close to God in an intimate, personal fellowship and relationship. And that is a promise we can depend on. And that is a promise worth celebrating. And that is a promise we ought to be thankful for. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so very much for the opportunity to assemble together this morning. And we thank you for your message. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would help this truth to resonate in our hearts this morning and throughout this day and this week. That we would be mindful of what you've done for us, what you've promised for us, who you are, what you've done. And that we would share this truth with others, that we would demonstrate it in our words and in our deeds. So that others may know what God has done. Because it surely is a joy, it is a privilege, it is amazing for us to know what you've done. All because you love us. We pray that we will know this truth and carry it with us. We pray, too, that each of us that are here this morning, that we've made the choice in our lives to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, as we are mindful, as Scripture has taught us, as seen in our, even this message this morning, that all of us need Jesus, and He's the only way. May we all make that choice and rejoice together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.